So, so I think that was interesting is that you were saying that the, you know, fascism is not, it, it is all contextual. It's like the way fascism worked in Europe in the 1920s, 30s and 40s is not the same as it's going to work in the 21st century in the United States and the paths to power are going to be different. So do you get the sense that the alt like the alt right is an example, but other far right ideological movements, like what is their path to power? Because I felt like Trump was like the one that could maybe help bring or 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 yeah, mainstream some of these hardline right wing positions, which I think he did to a certain degree. Yeah. But even then he was not hard enough for them. So I'm curious, like what are their strategies to get, I don't know, like any sort of influence on the culture and, and especially in the politics and like how things are implemented uh, policy wise? That's a really good question. And it's not one that I think I'm going to give a very, very satisfying answer to, okay. unfortunately. Um, but I can talk a bit about why it's an unsatisfying answer. So there's a, I think, People have often, people have read my book or other things I've written, and I've gotten this from, from people who kind of know maybe around the, the way around the discourse. They assume that, you know, I publish on a left-wing press and I come from left-wing background, that I'm going to use these sort of like traditional Marxist analyses about fascism. You know, fascism, you know, comes from the coalition of the middle class with the other, you know, like these different kind of uh, materialist, as they'll call them, explanations. And I don't use any of those uh, because I don't think that makes sense because I actually think those are context dependent and they don't actually say anything about what fascism is. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it actually lets the working class off, class off the hook um, for being actually parts of rank and file fascist movements. Um, and instead, I actually think that the path to power, as you're saying, I think that's actually going to change over time because what power actually is changes over time and what pathways to leadership are changed over time. So, yeah, Trump, in a way, could be a path power. Trump, not an open fascist, more like a national populist, more like a, you know, like you see in a lot of populist parties. Um, and so he'll be slightly more moderate. He'll have a certain a certain kind of popular rhetoric. It won't do the full elitism thing. He won't do the open white nationalism thing, but they can get some things through. And maybe that's a stepping stone to something even further past Trump. And maybe that shifts the GOP enough towards American nationalism and civic nationalism that they can uh, start to move it towards ethnic nationalism in the generations afterwards. That's a possible pathway to power. Another pathway to power is to not even think so much about electoral politics at all, and instead to create kind of popular movements that reflexively do influence policy, just because, for example, they influence the, the nature of the GOP and the Everton window, but also have a bigger effect on things outside of policy, things that policy only responds to, like social systems that are not codified in law, uh, you know, uh, creating militant on the ground movements, uh, you know, revenge oriented uh, social struggles, like, like, for example, the Klan in the 20s, basically enforcing social control at the point of lynchings, but not necessarily always arguing for those to be codified in law. There's a lot of ways that people take power. And what it's really important now is that the party structures and political structures have largely broken down and have become much different. And how we think of this leadership is much different. I mean, if we're going to hop on Twitter right now, is it going to be political leaders that dominate? Or is it going to be more like social leaders? Is there influencers? Is there artists? Is there actors? I mean, fuck, there's all kinds of people that take leadership roles in that way. And social networks develop a much different. We have homogenized communication networks through like Web 2.0 functions. You know, we use things like Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat. Those are ways that people communicate um, that didn't exist previously. So structures of power and pathways of power adapt to that. And so right now we're in an accelerating period where social formations are just simply different. So the unsatisfying answer is I can't tell you, I think, 100% exactly what that path to power will be because I don't know entirely what power will look like. I can tell you that it's easy to sort of catch up with them as they're catching up with themselves. And I think accelerationism of some kind, of some brand, has come into much more vogue in the far right. And the belief that the U.S. will break up or that the liberal consensus of, of Western nations will break apart, and that in that breakdown, the hegemony of the political and economic systems will be fragmented enough that they don't need to vie for major power. They don't have to vie for small power. Um, one of these talking points that used to come out of the 90s, but I hear it in all kinds of radical circles, is that like capitalism and the state are so powerful that they're just recuperating things all the time, that you know, 
uh, that they are they're overwhelming uh, people's daily lives, that they affect us in such deep ways. We, we can't, you can't go through one day without being affected by the state and capitalism. But the reality is we're in a, a system that's actually breaking down very completely, where what used to be called like lumpen proletarian, like mass classes, is only expanding as people get pushed out of the economy. Um, you know, we when I was in the 90s, we used to joke about how much we wanted to bomb the suburbs. But fuck, man, most people I know wish they could afford to live in the suburbs. You know, this is not the, um, the, the we're not trapped by affluence anymore. And so I think in a lot of ways, these far right movements, their path to power is in the total breakdown of the system. And it's really just a matter of time. I mean, I talk about this in the book a lot, but we are moving to a post present situation where the rules of the game are going to be different and we can't change that i mean we just can change what the outcome is but we can't change the fact that that the existing the existing state apparatus and the economics that back it up and the environmental destruction that it implies are going to be static that can't happen anymore so i think their pathway to power is partially in this post-america model but also it's in influencing people outside of just the official organs of state power Okay. Yeah, there seems to be, sometimes I feel like the left and the right run parallel in some ways, which is that there is this general acknowledgement on the, on the far left that like we need to either that revolution's coming, which I don't know if anyone really believes that anymore, but there's that sense that like that could happen or that this sort of breakdown is occurring. And then we have to seize that moment in order to push for mutual aid, you know, pushing for some kind of democratic socialism or, um, or anarcho-socialism of some kind, or, you know, like, like things like that. And I also see that on the right. I see the far right. They're like, we're also pushing for collapse and breakdown. We see the writing on the wall too, but we want to build an ethno state or some sort of whatever it is. And so that's, I don't know. I, I don't know what to uh, make of that. <laughs> I don't know if there's a question in there. It's just like, sometimes the parallels are disturbing because we're both seeing the same things. Both sides are seeing the same things, but how they react to it are very different. I don't think that the difference, and this is what again gets back to my argument about fascism is I don't think the difference between political ideologies or movements is in their form. I don't think that it's in how they try to affect power. I think it's in the content, the ethical, maybe, maybe not even ethical, but ethical and kind of structural content that makes up their vision of the world and what they think is a kind of positive direction, what would be a negative, what kind of costs they're willing to accept, that kind of thing. So whether or not they want a reformist or, or a kind of more profound reformist or a rad radical, meaning that it you know, rethinks the basic assumptions of the social system and requires some kind of revolution, th there's, there's an entire range of that. But I, and the argument I always make is that doesn't dictate how uh, what determines our ideology. There's other factors that determine it. But, you know, it, and I talk about this in the book, is that, you know, if we're looking, if people are looking at radical movements and they're looking for an old-fashioned revolution, that's not possible. But that doesn't mean that you aren't living through these revolutionary transformations or that that kind of revolutionary change isn't admirable and valuable. It's just a matter of how we think of it. So if we're living through a period of crisis, what does it take to rethink that away to retake that away from the kind of negative characterization mm -hmm. where now we're talking about something that's dismal and awful and we're pushing it off the cliff instead i think about it more about participating in this radical change one where the basic assumptions are changing because those assumptions no longer are present they're not just failing but they're not even present anymore one of the things that was really true about the pandemic that was not true about crisis before is that mutual aid networks were able to fill the were able to do work because they actually filled the gap, not ideologically, but materially. You know, I used to do Food Not Bombs and other things before, and, and frankly, we didn't do it very well. And people came there for ideological reasons, not because we provide, you know, we were the link in the chain of people's food system or something like that. And, you know, and, and soup kitchens probably did it a lot better, and state services certainly did it a lot better. And that's, that, you know, that's a, you know, in particular communities, largely white communities, the communities of color have had, had different experiences and they've done more effective medical aid work because of that. But what happened in, in, with around the coronavirus, as it happened in a lot of communities of color, is that their mutual aid stuff was actually really necessary because those services simply weren't there. And so in filling that gap, that was a sort of revolutionary process, right? 
the apocalypse of not having services was met with by a radical change in social conditions by trying to meet that need. So in a way, that was a revolutionary process. And people meet those challenges by trying to uh, meet the answer, re- meet answers to the problems of right now by also thinking into the distant future about how can you reorganize social relationships.